Mr Chairman, I thank members for their hearts. MOE is committed to giving every child the best start in life, not just in school, but for the future. Ms Denise Poa, Mr Sia Kenpeng, Ms Fu Miha and Mr Zainal Bin Sapari highlighted the driving trends of today and asked how we will prepare our children for the future economy. I agree with them that given the trends, tomorrow's jobs will require innovation. We will prepare our young, we will prepare our children from young, and we start from a position of strength. Over the years, we have developed an education system that is effective in inculcating students with sound values and equipping them with a strong academic foundation. We have built upon this base in the last few years. One, we have strengthened our focus on the holistic development of every child. We have dialed back on an overemphasis on academic grades. Teachers today coordinate to manage the assessment and homework loads. We took steps to reduce the competitive pressures in our system so that students can focus on their learning. For example, from 2021, the new PSLE scoring system will measure how well a student has learned and not how he has done in comparison to his peers. Ms. Denise Poa asked if we can pilot no PSLE through trained schools. I understand her good intentions, as well as the stresses that parents and students face. Stress arises from a complex mix of factors policies, expectations, perceptions, mindsets, and ground realities. The PSLE changes we have made are important changes at the policy level. However, it will take time for the effects to be felt on the ground, including other policy measures like subject-based bending to increase the porosity in our schools. However, we do not think that removing the PSLE is the way to go. The PSLE remains a useful checkpoint at the end of primary school to help us determine each child's academic strengths, where they lie. This guides the child to a suitable academic program in secondary school, one that would best fit his learning needs. The PSLE does not, however, cast in stone what students can achieve in school, in life, or any time in the future. Removing the PSLE and having a through train will only transfer the stress on parents and students elsewhere, such as to the primary one registration, where if I can paraphrase Ms. Fu Mi Ha, in her words, will then be a 10 to 15 years raise to safeguard the child's interest. The anxieties at P1 then will be tremendous. Also, the O levels and the N levels at the end of this through train will really be most stressful, a single exam in the whole career of a child's life. Mr. Faisal Manap suggested for MOE to introduce psychology in the secondary school curriculum. Psychology, however, is an abstract discipline, not age-appropriate at secondary school level. A better, broader approach to fulfil the same intent is to focus on 21st century competencies in our curriculum, create more space for informal learning, learning through play, and encourage opportunities for character building in the classroom, outside the classroom, in the CCAs, including our enhanced outdoor education. This supports the social emotional development and character building of our students. Ms. Poa asked about the 21st century competencies framework and when it was last reviewed. It was last reviewed in 2014, and also during the time when I entered MOE, where I took a fresh look at the 21st century competencies framework. Our teachers in tandem are provided many professional development opportunities and resources to support their learning and keep them updated to all the different uh, gorges that uh, Ms. Poa has mentioned. And we have also initiated the Singapore teaching practice, where the best teaching practices are shared online amongst teachers. Two, we are creating multiple pathways to success, something that Mr. Lau Tia Kiang mentioned. We introduced subject-based bending 
to allow upper primary and secondary school students to take subjects they are strong in at the higher level. Beyond academic strengths and interests, we are providing many opportunities for discovery and talent development in the sports and the arts. Mr Edwin Tong made good points about sports in schools and developing sporting talent. Today, primary school students learn fundamental movement skills in different sports in their PE lessons, a wide range. Primary 4 and Primary 5 students who are interested in sports CCAs not offered by the school can consider joining MOE's centrally run junior sports academies, which offer a variety of sports modules. In secondary school, students learn at least six sports, six sports, and take part in at least three inter-class sports competitions. A third of our students enrol in sports CCAs. Of this, 60% are non-school team players. Our schools understand that the value of sports cannot be measured by performance merely in the inter-school games. MOE also promotes programs organised by Active SG to encourage our students when they are not in school to participate in sports in the community. Three, we are developing positive attitudes and dispositions for lifelong learning. I have highlighted repeatedly in this house and outside the need to nurture the joy of learning and entrepreneurial dare. These are important because they sustain self-directed lifelong learning and instill an innovative entrepreneurial spirit in our children. This may not be measurable, but certainly observable. They are of utmost importance to shift us away from simply studying for exams to learning for life. Mr Lo Diakyang asked that MOE complete our transformation by changing the entrenched culture of an overemphasis on academic results. He understands that it will take time. I agree. And I thank Mr Lau for his cut and will consider his suggestion for the study proposal. The many changes I've mentioned are meant to take pressure off parents and students, reducing the chasing after the last mark in our school system. Ultimately, I hope to partner parents and students themselves to reduce their anxieties and stress. Many parents I've spoken to tell me they agree with the directions that we have taken. They also ask, like Ms. Fumiha, what will all this mean for their children's learning experiences in school. As I mentioned earlier, our education system today equips our students with a strong academic foundation and sound values. These are significant strengths. Mr Pritam Singh mentioned education systems in Israel and Finland in the budget debate. Indeed, there are strengths in these systems that we can learn from. But we are circumspect when we study, when we study other systems. We do not blindly seek to replicate other systems in Singapore, nor simply adopt new trends. In fact, these countries are also looking towards Singapore and wanting to learn from us. Consider Israel. I visited Israel and looked at their talent development and innovation ecosystem. It has a strong disposition in this area. But overall, it has weak averages. If we use PISA as one indicator, Israeli students underperform the OECD average. There is also a significant education outcomes gap between the average and the top Israeli students. We don't want this in Singapore. Here, we have high averages where our students, regardless of SES, outperform most of their peers in different countries. Rather, we will improve our education system by building on our existing strengths, even as we explore new possibilities. Let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. As such, on top of strong academic foundations and sound values, we want to get our students to move beyond the classroom and apply their knowledge in the real world. This will help nurture our next generation of change makers. Our students must be able to connect their head knowledge to their hands and create value. And their hands must also be connected to their hearts so that they contribute their knowledge and skills to the betterment of society. 
education must go beyond the classroom and academic grades. This is key. I will focus the rest of my speech on how we will anchor this within our education system through the lived experiences of our students. But first, let me tell you a story of two cars. I met two 10-year-old boys at a community event some time ago. They wanted to show me their toy car. I thought to myself initially, what was this about? But when I saw the car, I got interested. You see, the car was not any sexy toy. It was very plain, made out of cardboard. The boys actually took their mother's shoe boxes, cut off the top and the bottom, and fashioned a flat chassis. They then got a set of wheels, mounted them on together with some rudimentary drivetrain, and wired the system up. Then they applied what they had learned about energy in their science class, put on top of the miniature, put on top of the chassis miniature solar panels, and made their own solar-powered car. And it worked brilliantly. Their eyes sparkled when they talked to me on that Saturday morning as they showed me their solar toy car. This car is made out of pure fun, pure curiosity. These boys, all of 10 years old, applied what they had learned in science class to build their own toy. Impressive. The second car is also a solar power car, but this time it is a racing car. This car was built by a team of Singapore Polytechnic students taking part in the 2017 World Solar Challenge. They competed against 39 other teams from all over the world, including Cambridge University and Stanford University. They took 20 months to make the car using a high-tech carbon fiber reinforced composite body. The top speed of this solar car is 100 kilometers per hour, built by 18 to 20 year old boys. The team had a difficult race. They met with rough weather, met with an accident, and unfortunately did not finish within the deadline. However, I want to celebrate their success and included them in my speech. This car was built out of passion, deep skills, and resilience. Though they may not have won, the learning in their journey is invaluable. These two cars may be miles apart in technology and horsepower, but educationally, they are part of the same journey, from curiosity to mastery, from knowledge to application. We want all our students to be able to make this type of learning journey. And our vehicle is applied learning. What is applied learning? It is a mode of learning for all students, not just a separate track for vocational students. Students learn by applying and by doing. They learn beyond the classroom. They see for themselves how they can apply what they have learned to the real world. And from all the interactions I had with students, I see them enjoying learning. They are self-motivated or become self-motivated. These are powerful learning experiences and they stick for life, driving lifelong learning. Since 2013, we have encouraged schools to develop their own applied learning programs, ALPs. All secondary schools now have ALPs. It is a diverse, colourful and exciting landscape catering to a wide range of interests. STEM, languages, humanities, business, entrepreneurship, aesthetics, interdisciplinary fields. And I will now include STEAM, as Ms. Denise mentioned, to add arts into the STEM. All the ALPs importantly encourage exploration, ideation, and creativity. There are no tests or exams. I've emphasized this to MOE. Students learn through experimentation. They try, fail, try, learn from it, and try again. Let me share with you some of the experiences with students. I recently met some Fuchun Secondary students, and they tell me their school has an ALP called Innovations in Science and Technology for Sustainability. They all learned basic coding and programming and apply their coding skills to program robots. They do it in secondary one. I met one secondary four boy. His name is Zichin. 
together with his team, Zichin designed and built from scratch a robot that could move on different terrains, even on water, to retrieve and transport objects. Zichin told me that when they started, and I quote, everything was in a mess. They had to learn to work as a team, put in place a plan, work each boat, gear and wire step by step to fulfil their design. They went through many iterations. Surprisingly, Zichin told me his biggest lesson learned through this ALP was not just in creating the robot. You see, his team had to bring their robot to the Science Centre Makers Fair and he had to practice public speaking and he says it is not his forte. And he had to explain his robot to every visitor interested in his robot. In his words, he said, these are things that I cannot learn in a classroom. This is the value of applied learning in real life. Some of our primary schools have also developed ALPs. I visited Tegwai Primary, which runs an applied learning program called Media Wiz Kids. I met Masara, a cute petite primary five student. She wanted to help her schoolmates tell fake news apart from real news. So she worked with her friends and teachers to make a short three-minute video. In the video, Masara explains what fake news is, why people create it. She also suggests how to tackle it. And you know, we all debate about fake news in this very chamber. Through applied learning programs, our 10-year-old students are teaching it in their own way in school. It is a refreshing take on a very real concern. Masara and her friends narrate and present with great confidence and clarity. Importantly, Masara's teachers not only use the video to raise information literacy amongst the students, but also inculcate values. The video has been uploaded onto the school's Facebook and I encourage all of us to take a look. I am very proud of the confident and creative students our schools have nurtured through their ALPs. But I'm even prouder of our teachers who have committed their time and effort to develop applied learning experiences for their students. Ms. Elaine Ko, a teacher I met from Fuchun, told me the difference she saw in her secondary four normal technical students, Viknesh and Kumaran, after they have participated in the Makers' Fair. She shared that they were very engaged and focused when they tinkered and built things. And when I met Vinesh and Kumaran, they told me they are interested to study aeronautical and mechanical engineering at ITE. They want to design and build aeroplanes and racing cars. ALP has ignited a passion in them to want to continue their learning and their maker journey. Applied learning programs are intentional ways to spur innovation in our students. MOE will build on the good work done on ALPs. I've directed all primary schools to set up applied learning programs by 2023. We will also support schools with ALPs to further enhance and strengthen their capabilities and programs. This is an investment worth making to nurture innovation and creativity and importantly, prepare our children for our future. MOE will make another major investment to prepare our children for the future. We will put aside a significant budget to develop the New Science Centre. The New Science Centre will play a key role in providing such applied learning experiences for all students when it is completed by the mid-2020s. It will bring science to life through immersive and interactive exhibits and experiences. It will partner homegrown and international companies to provide a wide range of programmes for our students and youth. Hands-on maker workshops, experiments in specialised laboratories, opportunities for mentorship and research. And I'll, remember to add, and I'll remember to add the artistic element into it as well. It is not just the applied fields where applied learning is relevant. Our teachers are making a big effort to infuse applied learning experiences into their day-to-day -day teaching. For example, we are using applied learning to make our mother tongue languages come alive for our students. This will help foster their appreciation for languages and strengthen their proficiency, which Ms. Tim Pei Lin spoke about, 
and which Mr Asmun Ahmad and Mr Low Thia Kiang also mentioned in the budget debate. I will now move on to connecting the hands and the hearts. It is critical that we equip our children with the right values and develop, them, and develop in them a heart for others. Without the right moral compass, talented individuals can do more harm to society than good, and that would be tragic. Just like knowledge, values cannot remain simply in the head. They must be acted out, applied to the real world. Mr Ang Wei Neng encouraged schools and students to work with their communities. I mentioned my visit to Teck Whai Primary earlier. During my visit, I met a Primary 6 student. Her name is Zhe Jin. She showed me a pair of chopsticks that she and her team designed for people with weaker muscular control such as our elderly. Zijin explained that she and her team had first thought of a catch-and-release mechanism to allow users to use the chopsticks with minimal strength. And she built this model. Nothing fancy. Using simple materials, chopsticks, a straw, a spring and a masking tape. And in this model, she designed to help the elderly grab food. She experimented several times until she was satisfied with the catch and release function. With this design, she went on to 3D print a plastic prototype with the help of her teachers. This is the 3D print chopsticks. However, she's not satisfied with the plastic prototype as it did not work as well as the initial prototype. You see, she has probably reversed the hinge. But I've given her some possibilities and she told me she will work to improve her prototype. She's a primary six girl. And Zichin is not alone. Her schoolmates in Teck Whai Primary, iDesign Club have built learning aids for their peers with dyslexia and other prototypes to improve the quality of life for the physically disabled or the elderly. Through the iDesign Club, they not only learn about design principles, but equally important, they are tacitly learning to care to empathise and to serve others in the community. Zichin and her schoolmates may only be in primary school, but under the guidance of their school and teachers, they exemplify what we want to nurture in our young. The connection between the head, the heart and the hands, innovating to improve the lives of others, developing leadership, empathy, care and importantly, resilience. Applied learning in real life is so much more effective than just doing it in the classroom. Besides developing solutions for the community, our schools and students have also partnered the community to strengthen culture and heritage. A good example is Bulan Bahasa, the Malay language month. I work with Minister Masagos on this. The community hosts activities such as writing workshops and storytelling that broaden students' exposure to language and culture. Students, in turn, contribute to the community. They set up activity booths for the public. They also take on roles of Rakan Bahasa, or friends of the language, to serve as museum guides at the Malay Heritage Centre. The two-way partnership between schools and community not only enhances the learning of students, but allows them to put values into action and serve the community. In a separate event at Fiesta Bahasa, this time now at the National Library, I was very happy to see a bunch of Hua Chong Institution boys participating. You see, they were learning Malay, trying to learn to speak it fluently. These Chinese boys from a SEP school were interacting with our Malay students and parents naturally, without a hint of any language barrier. Mr Chair, this is applied learning in action in languages to promote our Singapore's unique cultures and heritage. As we strive to build a caring and inclusive society, we must make sure that no child is left behind. Last year, the government announced major plans to strengthen the preschool sector to give every child a good start and the best chance to succeed in life. This included upgrading the preschool profession to attract good teachers and careers. I welcome Dr Intan's suggestions. I'm happy to update that we are on track for the National Institute of Early Childhood Development, NIEC, to be fully operational by January 2019. 
NIEC will offer a range of quality programs to prepare those who aspire to join the early childhood sector with a good foundation for a career as an EC professional. I would like to reassure Dr. Intan that EC training today is already delivered with a heavy emphasis on practical skills. Most faculty are experienced practitioners in the preschool sector. It will be no different in the NIEC. Separately, MOE has facilitated professional exchanges between MK operators, educators, and also primary school teachers. They help develop mutual understanding, which smoothens the transition from kindergarten to primary one. MOE is also committed to providing quality and affordable education to all Singapore citizens, regardless of their financial circumstances. Our education today is heavily subsidised at all levels. Ms. Denise Poir mentioned digital equity as learning is done more online. This year, we will be rolling out the student learning space, SLS, to all students. SLS will provide high-quality, curriculum-aligned learning resources and online learning tools for students. This will drive self-directed learning, which can take place anytime, anywhere, and hopefully reduce the reliance on tuition as well. MOE has provided funding to schools, which can be used to subsidise students from less advantaged backgrounds for them to purchase mobile learning devices. Mr Edwin Tong and quite a few others in the budget debate asked about EduSafe contributions. We will increase the annual EduSafe contributions from 2019. With this increase, students can participate in more activities such as creative writing, creative writing programs and learning journeys to broaden their learning experiences. The government also provides a range of financial assistance schemes to assist those who are in need. <coughs> Dr. Lim Wee Kiap and Ms. Cheng Li Hui asked about this. At the primary to pre-university levels, Singaporean students who need assistance can tap on the MOE Financial Assistance Scheme, FAS. We will do more for students from lower income families by enhancing the MOE FAS. We will raise the income criteria for gross household income per month from $2,500 to $2,750, as well as the per capita household income per month from $625 to $690. We will increase the annual bursary quantum for pre-U students from $750 to $900. We will provide 10 meals for secondary school students under the school meals program, an increase from the seven we provide currently. That is in answer to Dr. Daniel Goh. We will also increase the income eligibility criteria for EduSafe Merit Bursary and Independent School Bursary. Overall, with these enhancements, the various financial assistance schemes will cost the government close to $100 million per year and will benefit around 90,000 students in total. Mr. Chairman, I have said what MOE our schools and our teachers are committed to doing. But let me emphasise that we cannot do this alone. We need the whole nation to move with us towards holistic education, and parents play a most important role. I strongly urge all parents to give our children the time for their minds to imagine, space for them to experiment and learn to embrace and take risks, opportunities to learn from failing, trying, relearning, trying until they succeed. Mr Chairman, let me conclude with a story. I visited Assumptions, let me say that again, I visited Assumption English School last July to open their upgraded school site. The opening ceremony was a most unusual one, hinged on robots program by their students, part of an ALP. I was invited to participate in a robot race on stage to move the robots in order to switch on an array of bright coloured lights to mark the official opening of the school. The robots were powered solely by wind and controlled by an iPad. My engineering mind straight away went into a thinking mode and I thought these robots could fail easily. And when they fail to function, the bulbs will not light up and the failure will be significant in front of the whole school, a hall full of parents, students 
MOE senior officials. After the ceremony, I congratulated the then principal, Mrs. Mabel Leong, and I quietly asked her, what would you have done if the robots did not work? What was the backup? She told me quietly too, Minister, there is no backup. <laughs> she said that if the robots did not work despite all their planning and efforts, she would have simply stood up, apologised to me and sought my understanding to skip the segment. In spite of the risks, she decided to keep the robot segment, I suspect because she's proud of her students and it showcased her students' pride and their learning. I must tell you, I smiled the widest smile in an entire week, knowing, that what Mabel, knowing what Mabel was doing. Our principals and schools are moving in the right direction. More of them are taking calculated risks for their students to have the time and space for experimentation, to try, fail, try again, even in front of a minister. Seeing how the schools and educators are changing, I sincerely urge all parents to join us in creating similar opportunities for our children. The results of such opportunities may not be immediately apparent, but the true test for all of us is not any single exam. It is the test of life. It is such opportunities that will benefit our children for a lifetime, much more than cramping their free time with excessive tuition. I hope all parents will encourage their students when they participate in their schools, ALPs, outdoor education program, value in action activities. Engage them in conversation over their applied learning experiences. Share in their successes and setbacks. Share in their joys. Empathize with their failing. Create more of such learning experiences for them in the classroom and outside the classroom. With the full support from educators and most importantly parents, our children will get the best start in life, whatever the future may bring. They will acquire the skills and values to thrive in the future. A brighter future of greater fulfilment awaits them. Thank you.